discussion today, I do want to uh, just to get a few bit of bookkeeping uh, out of the way. Uh, please look for information on uh, submitting uh, and obtaining CME in the chat. Uh, that will be posted throughout the meeting. Uh, this is a this is a meeting at our ethics conference where we do encourage. Uh, this actually is designed, in fact, uh, to, for discussion, and we we actually do not have a lot. Perhaps not more than fifteen minutes total of actual presentations today. So, as such, um, given that that you all have uh, are not able to unmute, uh, these are the ways that you can be unmuted. You can simply uh, use the raise your hand command in Zoom. You can also in the chat. Uh, just ask to be unmuted or say ask to make a comment. Um, we have an ability to make you a co-host. So if you see that you're a co-host, that just means that you now have freedom to unmute or unmute yourself at your discretion. If you are get, uh, asked to unmute, uh, Ethan gives you that permission, then you'll be unmuted as long uh, as, as you speak until you remute, and then you'd need to ask for permission again. Uh, so again, if you feel like you'd like to make numerous comments, uh, we can certainly make you a, a co-chair. Uh, medical students, uh, residents, everyone, we do uh, ask for your commentary and engagement. Uh, so in terms of framing ethics, uh, it's again worthwhile to review the four attendants of medical ethics, uh, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, uh, and justice. And this framework is, uh, it, I can share a paper uh, that, that uh, outlines uh, these four tenets and it, it talks about this concept of uh, prima facie and, and essentially that, that means at first sight, uh, at first face in Latin. And uh, what that implies is in the absence of conflict between any of these uh, tenets of medical ethics, uh, you should follow, and we are obligated as physicians to follow uh, the, the tenant, right? Whether it's just autonomy uh, only, or if it's beneficence, uh, if indeed there's not conflicts with others. However, uh, there is, uh, you know, nary a, a, an ethical dilemma that we're going to face that won't have some, some conflict between one or two of these areas. And with that as a preamble, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in and uh, introduce and acknowledge our, our presenters today. Dr. Ariana Levin will be presenting first. She comes to us uh, by way of Wild Cornell Medical School. She is a current PGY3. Uh, I would never steal her thunder and announce what her career plans will be, so she can certainly uh, share that with you at the beginning of her, uh, her case presentation. Uh, next, we'll go to Brad Jacobson. He comes to us by way of UC Irvine Medical School. He is a chief uh, resident here. Most of you know what his next steps will be, but again, I'll let him uh, tell you with all the excitement and zeal that Brad is capable of, of what his next steps will be in his career. And finally, Han Gam Lee, she came, comes to us by way of University of Michigan uh, Medical School uh, and did her residency at Northwestern and is uh, currently our first year retina fellow. Uh, thank you to each of you for taking time, particularly before OCAPS to present to us. Us. Without further ado, uh, Ariana, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Petty. Uh, anyone waiting, uh, I am planning to apply to glaucoma, um, but today I have a case to share and then we can discuss. Let me share my screen. Okay. So you should see a document that starts with 73 year old male at the top. Um, this is a case of a 73-year-old man who had come into us with a past ocular history followed by optometry of cataracts and ocular hypertension. In September, he was first referred from optometry for evaluation of his cataracts for surgery, and he was seen for this cataract evaluation in October. On that evaluation, his visual acuity was count fingers at 10 feet in the right eye and count fingers at eight feet in the left eye. His pressures are 25, which was typical for him. There was no uh, documented APD. And on description of the cataracts in the eye exam, both of his cataracts were described as four plus nuclear sclerotic, one plus uh, PSC. There was a view back to the fundus and uh, it was clear enough for there to be documentation of a 0.5 cup to disc, um, pigment modeling in the periphery, normal vessels, and uh, even a nevus in the left eye. He underwent cataract surgery in the right eye first and was seen for his um, post-op week one visit in November. 
And he commented at that visit, the surgery didn't really help. At that visit, his visual acuity in the right eye was still count fingers at 10 feet. Uh, the left eye was unchanged. His pressure had come down to 13 um, and there's still no APD. And then in the uh, assessment and then plan at this visit, the comment was the patient would still like to move forward with cataract surgery in the left eye and a referral was made to neuro-ophthalmology um, after no improvement in vision of the right eye. He was seen later that month with neuro-ophthalmology and on further history at that visit, he said that he woke up with vision loss in August, uh, so a couple months before his cataract evaluation. He had had neon green and lavender flashes a few weeks prior to this vision loss in August. A couple of years ago, he had been 2025. He does crossword puzzles and had been doing crossword puzzles until this acute event in August. He wasn't seen um, in August at the time of the event. Further workup was done. He had an MRI of the brain that was normal. Um, he had an ERG that demonstrated optic neuropathy. And then he had an extensive lab workup for optic neuropathy um, that did not reveal the etiology. So at that point, the comment was that there was a discussion with the patient, uh, his wife and his son, that we don't expect the second cataract surgery to improve vision, but we'll leave it up to them whether to cancel or not he decided not to cancel and um, felt that he wanted to try anything at all that might give him some hope for his vision. And then he was seen uh, after his cataract surgery in the left eye uh, at the post-op week one visit. And he said, there's no improvement. This is just like how the right eye was after surgery. His visual acuity at that time was count fingers at one foot in the right eye and count fingers at two feet in the left eye. He also asked if he could trial steroids, and the comment at that visit was that he was counseled that we will not trial steroids without a diagnosis. So uh, in the blue box, I have a few questions for discussion, um, but we can take this where we want to. So the first question is, should the patient have been offered the option of proceeding with cataract surgery in the left eye? And the second question to think about is um, how or whether refusing the patient's request for a trial of steroids is different or similar to refusing the patient's request for cataract surgery. Um, and now I'll open it up. Thank you, Ariana. Again, uh, please uh, either raise your hand or actually uh, the chat would be the preferred method if you'd like to be unmuted. Uh, we, we definitely would like to encourage uh, some discussion and, and conversation in this. Uh, we, we are broadly going to be speaking about uh, when a patient has a desire that uh, has some sort of conflict with the physician. Uh, this is one case outlining several, uh, several issues. So we talked briefly earlier about uh, beneficence and non-maleficence. And, and oftentimes, as we're looking at the conflict between these two, we're trying to make a decision on perhaps the overall net benefit. Now, we do this uh, you know, within our own minds when we're thinking about uh, entering into a treatment or a surgery for someone, is there a net benefit? Uh, do the benefits outweigh the risks in this? So that, that is an entirely uh, uncommon to us in the way that we go about our clinical decision-making. However, um, we all have been in situations where the patient may have a desire that could be in conflict with what we think is right. And so in addition to comments uh, about uh, Dr. Levin's case and offering commentary on uh, her, her questions that she's posed, uh, would also welcome additional uh, cases you have experienced as you think about this, where perhaps a patient's desire um, may not may, may have conflict with what you think is the right next step uh, for some reason or another. So we are going to allow for a little quiet here. That's fine. You can use that to think about these issues. Comments uh, again. Raise your hand if you'd like to to comment. We'll for the most part be making people co-chair, so you can uncomment at will. Uh, but we definitely would like uh, Roger, um, uh, Randy, um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, make you co-chairs and you guys can unmute yourselves. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll start out. Uh, obviously, these are, these are tricky situations. And uh, um, I, I think that we have to be totally honest with our patients where uh, the uh, evidence is overwhelming that there is not going to be any improvement in association with cataract surgery, that uh, this isn't something that, that makes sense. But we have to be careful about 
assuming that we 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 know everything about it. So I mean, uh, I think if our knowledge base is, is truly unassailable, I, I think that we let people know that there there are there is potential risk from doing surgery and uh, uh, doing something in which there is no outcome. But I think we need to be uh, extremely certain about that. And I'll give you one example. This is actually the wife of a, of a very famous uh, physician, uh, probably one of the most famous physicians University of Utah has ever had. And she um, presented with a super dense cataract that she'd had. Um, and uh, uh, she was hand motions vision. And uh, uh, I and and uh, she was pretty confident that that uh, you know that she'd had uh, a pretty uh, uh, dense amblyopia. Uh, history was a little uncertain, uh, and I you know said, well, I don't think we should do the surgery, and she agreed. And then and finally we got to a hypermature situation with her cataract, where we had to take it out, <laughs> and she was 2020, and she was able to fuse, and she was delighted but furious that she'd been told forever not to have surgery and I just took it at history and there were things we could have done even then to kind of realize that she had more potential uh, and so uh, I just we just it, I think we have to be you know cautious where we're not quite certain but this one is I think pretty clear that surgery is is um, unlikely is unlikely to help uh, but if there, we if we're not certain and the patient is is very demanding, I mean the upside is high enough that I think we need to be flexible. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Dr. Harry, feel free to make your comments. Yes, um, I agree with Randy that these situations can be uh, challenging. I think in this case it's probably a little less difficult than other situations. This patient had a dense cataract, so you can certainly say, "Well, discuss with the patient, give them all the facts." You know, your other eye didn't do very well. The ERG showed probably some optic nerve problems, so the odds are you won't see very well. But you know, it's kind of your choice, and uh, as long as they're presented with the, the, all those facts and you know unbiased way to make the final decision, I think it's harder when you see patients with minimal cataracts. I've seen a number of patients referred that outside ophthalmologist told them, oh, you got a terrible cataract, you can't drive anymore, can't do surgery tomorrow. And they come and you've sort of got to talk to them the other way that it's not that bad, you know, you can probably wait for now. So that's, that's a harder situation. Um, but uh, in this case, I, I think it's, you know, reasonable to at least offer the patient, you know, the option. And as long as they understand family, I'd probably get family involved too, be sure they, they're on board that, uh, you know, the surgery may not do much, but uh, with the dense cataract, uh, maybe there might be some, as, as Randy's case, about a woman with dense amblyopia that ended up seeing pretty well. Sometimes you're surprised when, uh, when that when that's done. Yeah, a couple of points again. Uh, Dr. Olson's point about you know there is an unknown in this particular case, particularly with cataract surgery and what visual potential can be, and that's something that, frankly, in many ways we don't know. Uh, and you know, Dr. Harry, uh, well stated. You know the the, the challenge of, of perhaps the expectation of the patient not really uh, meeting what we think medically is, is possible. Um, Dr. Hoffman, you are unmuted. Yeah, I just want to say, I think it's important to acknowledge what the patient is really telling us here and that the patient's desperate to see better you know, and to acknowledge that and say that we're willing to do whatever we can to help accomplish that within reason. But, you know, Cataract surgery is just another way of trying to accomplish it, and it may not be the appropriate option, so that the patient understands that we're on their side. We're not just cutting them off, saying you don't get surgery. We want you to see better. And, and that tends to go a long way. Thank, uh, thank you, Bob. Um, that's one of the things, Dr. Hoffman, that's one of the things that, that has struck me recently. Uh, if you have someone coming in with uh, perhaps a, you know, a, a central sc scotoma from AMD, for instance, kind of mild to moderate cataract, uh, and, and for them, really any improvement in vision might make a real significant difference. Uh, Dr. Stagg, I believe you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I really liked what you just said, Dr. Hoffman. Um, 
when you think about those, I really like the the ethics framework, the four those four things. Um, what's hard sometimes is there's kind of gray lines or blurs where you're like, you know, there's a balance between those. But one of those four that I feel that I, if you had to choose one that you really liked, I really like the principle of autonomy. And it kind of goes along with that. And I think that I feel like that's something that we can take, we can, can t- take control of ourselves. So for example, I think that if you take the time and talk about the, be- the good that comes from it, talk about the potential bad, and then I really believe that patients can have autonomy and that they appreciate that and deserve that. And so um, I think for both of these questions, I think both doing the cataract surgery or not doing the cataract surgery and doing the steroids or not doing the steroids could be appropriate if, uh, if, you, if the patient understands and if the patient's making that choice for themselves. And I think that that also kind of like Dr. Hoffman was saying, then they can feel, they can know that they've done everything they can to see, or they know that they don't want to take that risk. Mm-hmm. And then, sorry, one other thing about the justice one, because I, I ask myself that all the time too. Um, I'm not saying anyone did anything wrong in this case, but sometimes we're influenced by what happens for ourselves. So we get paid for cataract surgery, but we don't actually get paid to give people steroids. And that's just something that I, that I keep in my mind. Am I being influenced by financial incentives for myself? Uh, thank you for uh, both of those comments. And um, I, I think always, um, you know, introducing the elephant in the room in terms of, you know, payment structure and the way that our uh, financial model is, is important uh, and how that may or may not influence decision making. So uh, you, you again made a comment as well, uh, Dr. Stagg, about uh, autonomy, right? And patient autonomy, being able to have some control over their care. And you'll see in the, the kind of next cases, there's also an element of our autonomy, right? And our ability to, to perhaps make the decision that we feel is best that will be in conflict. Uh, so we will, uh, Brad Jacobson, why don't you go ahead and queue up uh, your screen share. Uh, I do, now that we have uh, our, our sufficient quorum, I do want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Eileen Wong, who's uh, not in the Zoom today. She had a conflict. This entire ethics conference is actually her brainchild. Uh, and were it not for this conflict, she would be um, uh, she would be chairing chairing this uh, ethics conference. So uh, I, I would uh, ask if you do see her, uh, just uh, thank her uh, for this really thought provoking discussion. Dr. Jacobson, take it away. Okay, can you all see my screen? We can see your screen, and audio is good. Awesome. Okay. So, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Petty, earlier on. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know already, I will be headed to DC, actually the only one in my class that's not leaving Moran. So I don't really know what that says about me, but <laughs> I'm excited. Um, but uh, I am going to be presenting a case that I uh, was involved with kind of peripherally throughout the whole thing, but I initially saw the patient, of course, um, on four, at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, as it usually happens in Dr. Barlow's clinic. And so um, chief complaint, uh, she came in with left eye rejecting is what she says. She's a 74 year old female with a history of two previous PKs, um, initially for keratoconus followed by graft failure. Um, two days prior to the presentation, the patient felt that her left eye was just dry, um, not really painful. She presented to a clinic in Idaho where she lives, where they removed two sutures and started her on Durazole. Um, the following day, so this is one day prior to presentation at Moran, she woke up with very blurry vision. Um, she presented to the same clinic where they taped the eye closed and placed the shield. And then the, the following day, which was actually the morning of presentation at Moran, the pain increased and she presented again to the clinic. Per the clinic notes in Idaho, she had left eye uh, graft rejection with perforation and ophthalmitis, rapidly worsening pan ophthalmitis, graft rupture slash dehiscence. That was exactly from their note. And so, oh, sorry about that. Um, when she saw us her phys- on physical exam in the affected eye, she was bare light perception, um, unable to really visualize the pupils and she was in a significant amount of pain So um, she wasn't really even able to move her eyes. Uh, In the right eye, she was seeing 2060 and can pinhole to 2040. And um, 
So I actually have a picture of what her eye looks like. Sorry for those of you who are a little bit queasy, but I thought it could add to the discussion a bit. So you can see she's just kind of got diffuse erythema on that upper lid, brow, and cheek. She's got purulent discharge. She has severe injection um, and subconscheme, a completely opacified cornea that prevents view um, into any other ocular structure. She had some sutures inferiorly, but once again, it was a difficult view and a complete hypopion. Um, of note, she was Seidel negative. Um, so, of course, in these situations, when we don't have a view to the posterior segment, we perform a B-scan. The B-scan did not show any vitritis, uh, but did show some diffuse choroidal effusion. Um, and just to throw some social history in the mix, she recently had a husband who passed away of COVID. At, I think it was about three months prior and was terrified of hospitals. She currently lives in Felt, Idaho, which I Google mapped is about 281 miles away from Salt Lake, uh, four hour and 11 minute drive. Uh, the best corrected visual acuity in the impacted eye um, that we have on record is 2200. And that was in 2016, she was lost to follow up. Um, her life goal is to spend as much time with her grandkids as possible. Um, and her wish um, from presenting with us was just to take the eye out. Um, and so we, uh, our assessment of her, 74 year old female with a history of keratoconus status post two PKs presenting with purulent and ophthalmitis of the left eye. So we consulted retina per their notes, they would not recommend a tap and inject given no vitritis and definite risk of introducing pathogens into vitreous cavity. Uh, and given bare light perception, guarded visual prognosis, and high risk of progression of infection, the discussion discuss option of enucleation with patient, and she was in agreement. Um, there was a lot of people involved in this case, so we also consulted cornea, uh, discussed treatment options with patient and two sons, uh, recommended aggressive treatment with topical and systemic antibiotics, and then reevaluation. And then, of course, we consulted our plastics colleagues. Uh, who wanted the patient admitted to hospital for pain control, um, start topical vancomycin and tobramycin every one hour and recommend IV antibiotic coverage with gram positive and gram negative coverage. Um, and then of course, uh, frequent um, checkups on her on a daily basis. Hospital course, so she had worsening eye pain every single day. She actually developed pretty severe constipation and nausea secondary to dependence on opioids for the eye pain. Uh, her physical exam was not improving on the IV antibiotics and topical antibiotics. We had discussions with her and her two sons every day about the implications of evisceration and enucleation and patient adamant that she wants her eye removed. She had good understanding of this information, very, very good insight. And so um, she ended up undergoing an evisceration seven nights after admission to the hospital. And the specimen contained um, in quotes, disorganized, disorganized intraocular contents. And so that's it for my patient presentation, just some discussion points that um, I thought could fuel the discussion course, you guys can take this anywhere you'd like. But so we had several long discussions with different healthcare providers. The patient was adamant that she wanted her eye removed. She was pretty consistent throughout every single conversation. However, she was admitted for IV and topical antibiotics instead. The patient had good insight and family support. So should we have done this surgery earlier? And I'll kind of leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. We'll, uh, we'll just leave those questions up here for about uh, another minute, and then you can uh, stop sharing after that. Uh, you know, boy, a lot going on. Love to hear if, if, if they're available to unmute Dr. Lynn, Dr. La Rochelle, Dr. Crum, any of you uh, with comments, perspectives that can help add to this. I see Dr. Olson, you're unmuted. If you want to go ahead and make comments. Sure. Uh, yeah, these these are these are particularly tough cases, and uh, uh, I, I know our reluctance to uh, enucleate or eviscerate when we've got uh, uh, any chance that there might be some visual potential. But uh, uh, I've, I've talked to a lot of these patients in this kind of situation, and, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it, it is not uncommon that we, we do prolong their agony from what an outcome that's probably uh, going to happen. Uh, and so I, I think we should be willing to listen. So 
and talk to them. You know, in this particular case, all those choroidal certainly suggest, and the other exam is, is it probably, even though it was Cytel uh, negative at the time, that there probably, you know, was a breach, uh, that the suture coming out in a failing cornea, and there probably was a breach uh, of the incision. Um, it's probably filled up with fibrin and all that horrible mess that we're seeing in that eye, and that explains the choroidals, for instance, and and uh, uh, you know, I, in situations like that, I, I've, I've I've taken the 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 route. I said, well, let's let's just let's get a culture right now. Let's get some antibiotics and let's let's reassess. But rather than you know reassess uh, in in uh, uh, you know in in seven days or so, you know, make a decision. Give us forty eight hours, something that's a reasonable period of time. And uh, if it's a really bad organism and, and clearly there's not much of anything changing, uh, then, then I, I think we, we should be prepared to go ahead and step in and relieve them of their agony, uh, where it is, it is both clear that the prognosis is awful and the, the pain and the problems of being in the hospital are very real for somebody that age. So I'm not saying you necessarily do it immediately, but be, be pretty willing to throw in the towel when it's quite obvious that there's not much to be gained and a lot to be lost for somebody who's suffering. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Uh, you know, you bring up uh, one of the comments that, that struck me is uh, the, you know, you, you had written that she had good understanding. Uh, and, and I wonder, I'm not sure if um, Lisa Ord is available to unmute yourself. We certainly can. If you can you know, raise your hand or let us know in the chat, you can be unmuted. Uh, because that's something that comes up for me a lot. Um, we know how complex these issues are and they're hard for us to make decisions when we live in this space and are doing this all the time and thinking about the ramifications and seeing blind patients and seeing patients with poor outcomes and seeing patients who have gotten better. And, and kind of, you know, as we try to make that determination of how much the patient understands, you know, uh, Dr. Stagg, you know, to your point, how much autonomy can are we able to give? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear some comments on that. And, and it looks like Amy Lynn, um, I've just asked that you be unmuted. If it's okay, Amy, let's go ahead and let Lisa Ord comment first, and then we'll go to you, Dr. Lynn. Right. And I, I think that the issue um, really comes in to do they understand all of the ramifications of what they are asking for? And is there any other um, route? And the fact that uh, she was admitted for IV um, and topical antibiotics to try to, to save um, anything, I think, you know, even though she wanted the eye out, and a lot of times people in pain, patients in pain, they want something that right at that moment that they may not want later on. So, yeah, it, it becomes a real balancing act of, you know, uh, autonomy for the patient and also um, what is going to be right in the long, in the long run. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's such a great point. I mean, perhaps it is just, I need to be out of pain at this moment. And that is the answer staring them in the face um, within their uh, framework. Uh, Dr. Lynn. So um, I'm in agreement with um, uh, kind of a comment that's been made, and this is something that unfortunately doesn't, um, it happens pretty, you know, not, not too infrequently in cornea, a patient coming in who's PK with overwhelming infection. So I, again, if the patient is in agreement and we see that there's just a very, very poor prognosis for any useful vision in the eye, it definitely would be reasonable to intervene with enucleation or evisceration much, much earlier, again, with all the discussions that kind of come into play. Um, of course, if this was a, another patient that's, you know, just coming in with a mild, say, graft rejection, something that's very easily treatable, and the patient's saying they want their eye out, then, of course, then we have to say, no, this is not the right treatment, we can get you better. But in this particular case, with the um, kind of overwhelming infection, and the fact that this patient lives very far away from a um, you know, major medical center, it, and understands all the ramifications, has family support, then um, I fully support the patient in, in moving forward with uh, her wishes sooner. Thank you, Dr. Lennon. Uh, again, great 
great perspectives. And, and, and it, it also touches a little bit on uh, something we deal with, uh, perhaps not on such a high stakes basis, but we deal with on a regular basis is, um, you know, the referral between specialists, particularly in our building where we have so many subspecialists and, you know, when there is, you know, potential, just, just disagreement on the next best step, right? Perhaps they meet with you and say, this is reasonable and nucleation is uh, a very reasonable step. Whereas retina feels, look, we haven't even, uh, maybe even plastic feels, we haven't even given this a chance yet to heal. Uh, and, and now we're in a situation where the patient has expressed the desire. Um, we have providers with um, common goals, but yet uh, different, you know, next step pathways that they are uh, potentially suggesting. And, and I think the right person to resolve all of these questions is probably Dr. Stagg, since he brought up the autonomy piece and he said it was his favorite. Uh, because again, now we're dealing with autonomy of multiple, uh, again, multiple medical professionals. Uh, Dr. Stagg, you're welcome to unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand. I can. Um, oh, there we are. And let me just make sure. All right, you're able to unmute. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I really thought you made a great point. The, each of those, those four issues has something that complicates it and makes it challenging. And I think the big challenge for patient autonomy is understanding. So I thought, I thought that was a really good point. Um, and then the autonomy of different providers, my, my thought just thinking through this case as I was thinking about the residents who are often uh, in these complicated cases stuck in between communicating with different people and communicating with the, the, uh, the, te the patient, the providers, trying to verify understanding. And that, that can be really challenging. So I was wondering if some, maybe one of the residents who was, who was involved in, in there like, could talk about uh, yeah, Dr. Jacobson, perhaps you can mute make a comment. I, I, as I have gone on and seen more patients uh, that we followed in, in the continuity resident clinic, uh, it, it, it's not lost on me at all how vital the resident role is in being that, that, that one single common denominator throughout all of the care uh, and, and how this, this can certainly be a confusing labyrinth. Um, you know, just they very well may meet eight different doctors in two days, you know, for these complex mm -hmm. situations. Dr. Jacobs, why don't you go ahead and just make some comments from the resident perspective, and then next we'll go to uh, Hong Gem Lee for our final case presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. I was actually be interesting. I don't know, Sean Collin, if you're on. He was the consult's resident, I believe, at the time, and um, oh, he would be I'd be willing, yeah. So let's uh, ask Sean to unmute because he actually talked to them quite a bit. Uh, so, all right, Sean, you are asked to, go ahead. Yeah, hey there. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, on, on, on my, on that particular month of consults, this, I had this situation in, in several cases where there were all these different subspecialties involved. And it is a very difficult place to be in, especially when there's difficult uh, or different, um, you know, the same data is being observed by different subspecialties and you're getting sort of different messages from all of them. And there's really, uh, I mean, the, what ended up happening in this case that I thought was helpful was um, an email chain that sort of involved all of the uh, involved parties that finally got all the people on the same, because it's, 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 as a resident, it's really impossible short of getting the, um, uh, attendings who will be making the ultimate decisions, uh, together and, and having them converse. It, it's, it's kind of impossible to, to move forward with it. It, it seemed to me, um, and then one other thing I was thinking about that, that just made this case. A, li a little bit remarkable. And I, I too was kind of peripherally involved. I really only saw the patient a, a few times, um, but, but I was the, the consult resident. But every time I went to talk to her, she was very aware of her desire to have the eye removed, potentially just reflecting her acute pain. Um, and she had a lot of really good insight into that, um, wh which which, you know, just, just to sort of support what we've been saying that, that she did have very good insight throughout the process. Um, and and 
and and so yeah it was it was a it was a difficult um situation but i think once we got all of the providers together in in one place that's when we were able to move forward i just uh, would like to make a comment to follow sean's uh um thoughts so you know from this case i do i am really glad that dr stack uh, you brought up uh uh the concern for the resident involved in complicated case like this because i do really sympathize with how challenging it is for for our consulting resident because a one they are still in uh, early training for for pty2 and uh, and three they're still in their early phase of training and for them they're still learning and a lot of the information coming from different subspecialty, they are, you know, processing and trying to decide which one to listen to and which one is the ultimate correct answer. And there's no ultimate correct answer. And, and but then as, you know, fully trained MD and, you know, halfway through their residence training, have enough insight to know maybe what is the best for the patient. But sometimes that doesn't align with, you know, the what is you know dictated to them and for them that's a lot, a lot of challenging a lot of conflict and they have to go back and forth between dif different uh, providers uh, i actually was involved in this case uh, very early on and uh, and i was involved throughout th throughout the course of the discussion and it was also very difficult for me because as a retina fellow i am not the one to remove the eye i'm not the one to make a call on that the corner is fail here and that rely on the corner specialist rely on the oculoplastic uh, specialist but then i can see that you no know, we've been waiting around for a long time and i can see that the, the resident struggling to to try to like you know who do who did they go to and i think that thanks brad for like creating that email exchange because that really you know forced all of us to have a conversation and then when we see when we finally see that thing is not moving that somebody had to speak up and hey we have to do something and thankfully, in the end, everybody was on the same page, and in the end, the patient was happy with uh, with the final decision. But uh, that that just brought me to the um, the next question: is that you know, I really hope that this kind of case doesn't like repeat itself over and over again for the resident because it's a very very uh, time consuming and stressful situation for even for me to watch. And I really hope that there is a, some kind of protocol that the, the resident can follow uh, to help guide them to better facilitate or coordinate this kind of conversation to make things move uh, forward in a res respectful and effective manner for both the patient and all the team providers, all the providers involved in the patient care. And I think I, I was actually gonna <laughs> email Dr. Petty because you are the program director and you are ultimately the boss of the residents. And uh, I hold you responsible to, to make that kind of uh, workflow feasible for them. So I hope that there will be something in place going forward. Yeah, I, I sincerely can't thank you enough for that comment. Uh, it, it is so important that we always have an eye to doing better than we currently do. I know uh, Teresa Long has her ears peaked up right now. She will be uh, staying on with us as an academic fellow. And really, um, you know, our task, shared task together, is working to improve the consultation service and in particular this coordination together. So uh, Dr. Hartnett uh, is unmuted. We'll have her make a comment and then I'll make a brief comment and then we'll go ahead and go to your case, uh, Dr. Lee. Dr. Hartnett. Uh, thank you uh, and great discussion. And I wanted to um, uh, talk about cases like these over the years. And uh, even as a new, you know, as when I was a more junior faculty member and even as a resident or fellow, uh, what I found, you know, we're trained, I'm trained, we're trained as physicians to sort of take a certain approach with the patient and sort of un have an understanding about what's going on with the pathophysiology and all in a situation. Um, and sometimes I found it very helpful. In fact, in fact I often find it very helpful to bring on other team members. So we have a lot, we have Lisa Ord and Amanda and her team who can go in and talk to the patient and have a different perspective and even get more information about it. Uh, sometimes I actually reach out to risk management 
because like, for example, if there's a disconnect, what I'm saying to a patient just doesn't have any response, I'm probably missing something. I'm probably either missing something that I don't understand that the patient has a question about. I may not be using the right vocabulary. And sometimes that can be very helpful. So um, I just wanted to bring that up so that the residents and fellows don't feel like they have to make the decision or they have to find something. We do have other you know, really skilled professionals who make up our healthcare team to do the best for our patients. So I just want to Thank you, uh, Dr. Hardman. Uh, so, so well said. And, and uh, so, so for those of you outside that, that may not know, um, uh, Dr. Lisa Ord is a PhD. She's a licensed clinical social worker. She's the director of our uh, patient support services. And, um, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile, uh, Dr. Ord, if we just l let you unmute yourself for a moment. Um, uh, just any additional comments before we get to, to uh, Hung M. Lee's case? Uh, yes, absolutely. We're always very willing to to, to give our um, our take on on what where the patient's coming from. Um, and I know that you guys have so much on your mind about medical and um, the the physiology <laughs> and all of that other stuff that that um, sometimes the emotional components that um, make up a, a big deal of all of our decisions um, they can kind of get overlooked sometimes. And there may be something that um, we can shed some light on, or at least help you feel better about the decisions that you are making. Thank you. Um, sincere thank you, Dr. Ord. All right, Hong uh, Gam, take it away. You can screen share and present your final case for discussion. Okay. Uh... Okay, can uh, you see my screen? Just want to confirm. Yes, okay. audio is great. And All right, so we're flipping the size here. Um, you know, Brad is presenting something that on a case where the patient wants something, but there's hesitation um, on the, the surgical team or vice versa. Um, but, but this is different in the sense that like, uh, you will see. Okay, so this is 40 year old women. And uh, she has diabetes type two since age 13 and she suffered multiple end organ damage from poly control diabetes. So she's not a very healthy person. And uh, she pre initially presented to the retina service in two years ago, so January, 2019. And at that time she has a PD on both eye and the left eye had has a tracheal, tracheal macula off detachment for over a year already. Surprisingly, at this visit, the vision was still 2060 in that left eye with the Mac of TRD. And so then um, she um, uh, was signed for surgery, but it didn't happen for, for five months. And at this time, her vision declined to 2400. So she underwent a vitrectomy, laser, and gas in the left eye. And her post op recovery was not um, optimal, vitreous hemorrhage. So her vision never really recovered. And then uh, two months later, she came back with still vitreous hemorrhage that didn't quite clear. And there was a recurrent tracheal re retinal detachment now with PVR that was visualized on B scan. So at this point, vision was like hand motion, light perception. So then she underwent the second surgery, which was uh, vitrectomy, lensectomy, membrane peel, laser, and silicone oil. And again, her post-op course was also very uh, stormy. She has post-op eye pupil elevation up to 50. There was AC fibrin. There was concern for pupillary block. However, the patient didn't want an LPI. And around this time, vision was LP head motion. Okay, and then uh, she came back uh, the next month. Now she developed a new uh, macular involved TRD in the good eye, the right eye. And the left eye from the IOP spike and the inflammation now has a pupillary membrane that completely obscure the view to the back of the eye. And uh, so you see that there is a gap of, of her follow-up here. So from October, 2019, she did not come back to, she did not seek care for almost a whole year later. So after her second surgery, she was very upset, very angry with the moraine. Um, eye center 
because of her suboptimal post-op uh, recovery. She did not recover. She only lose vision from her perspective. From her perspective, it was our fault, the surgeon's fault. So she didn't follow up. She no show to her uh, appointments. And she finally came into triage um, uh, in July, 2020. That is about uh, nine months later because of left, left eye pain. Uh, nothing, uh, and she <laughs> specifically requests not to be seen by the retina surgeon who performed the first two surgery. And uh, so she saw, she saw uh, uh, attending in triage clinic and then they can't really figure out why she's having pain. Um, her pressure was okay on eye drops and there's no view to the back because you know, there's just that white pupil membrane that obscure. And uh, the thought was that maybe she could benefit from a yak laser to remove that membrane. So she was referred to uh, glaucoma specialist for, for that procedure. And of course, you know, we know that that probably shouldn't be done anyway because of the oil, it would just make a mess. So Dr. B was considering performing a secondary IOL and silicone oil removal, but that would require um, combined surgery with retina. And the patient doesn't want to be seen by the, the retina surgeon who operated on her eye the first two times. So she was sent to a different retina specialist, uh, Dr. C here. And so at this time, the plan was for, okay, we can try to go in, remove the oil, remove the synechia, remove the membrane and put in a secondary IOL. Uh, however, that didn't go through because she again disappeared for reason I would assume that's COVID, her other healthcare problems. So she disappeared for four months and, uh, and she, she state that no one called her to schedule surgery. There's no evidence of that. Um, and so at the last visit, this is end of January, early February. And so, you know, her right eye now has a chronic back of TRD 2150 and the left eye, is, you know, as I have said, a fake ear, white pupillary membrane blocking the view, vision is hand motion. And it's been hand motion since the second surgery. So, uh, you know, she continued to refuse surgery for the right eye, which is the eye that has any potential, if any. Um, but, and it's, but instead she insists on going ahead with surgery for the left eye. And so just want to summarize the course of the, the left eye so that we can have an understanding, an appreciation why this is a challenging you know, decision. So I had gone, two surgery and both surgery were her post-op recovery was not optimal. She never, she never get the vision that she was you know, satisfied with. Um, and she's hand motion right now. So this is just, uh, so, however, because of the patient insistent, we are planning for this. So it would require retractomy, silicone oil removal, cynical lysis, stuff in their IOL. And this is just a summary of her vision so that you can have an appreciation why we think that visual potential in this left eye is so limited or poor and probably she can probably see better than hand motion. So the 2400 here is uh, basically before the first surgery and after the first surgery, all we can get is hand motion, light perception, hand motion. Okay. And one could argue that OSC is hand motion because it's aphakic, because the silicone oil, because there's a white pure membrane. Um, but we need to remember that after her second surgery, she has, uh, IOP spike and fibrin, all of that. So it's not just her retina, there's also her nerve that is likely involved. Um, so the question is that, should surgery be discouraged for the left eye? You know, should we give in to the patient? Or should we discourage her? So uh, thank you again. And I think, again, just because of the complicated course, I just wanted to clarify one piece. Um, uh, the, the medical providers felt that surgery for the right eye had uh, potential benefit to the patient and, and did question whether or not there would be any benefit to the left eye. And yet the patient did want the left eye surgery. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the you know the kind of age old question that we we start to face the longer we're in our careers is you know when do we not operate when when is the right time to no longer um, you know take another stab at um, 
you know, no pun intended, um, at, at, you know, doing surgery uh, on one of these patients. Dr. Olson, I'm glad you're unmuted. Um, this is not a simple, straightforward one by any means. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, there, there were some simple things that we used to do. Uh, when, when I uh, worked with uh, Herb Kaufman, he uh, was known for someone who would often operate, and this is way back when things were much less advanced, particularly retinal surgery. So we're talking ancient, ancient period now, 45 years ago, um, is that uh, uh, we, we would often try to assess potential, uh, I think a little more than, you know, than, than we do today uh, to try to decide whether what there was a shot. We, there were, there were, there were uh, uh, things we would do uh, such as uh, uh, what, what he called a light field. I don't, uh, some people I think have forgotten some of these old little tricks, but a uh, uh, patient looks straight ahead. You, sh you shine a, a light out of a specific quadrant and, and the rapidity with which they'd point to it uh, am correlated amazingly well with uh, you know better than expected outcome in these really horrible cases. Um, the other one would be to just uh, blink, blink the light straight on, and then and then tell tell you tell you when they could see it. And uh, it was amazing how you could actually chart out a pretty good visual field this way on some of these uh, end stage patients. And it was pretty obvious when they'd lost a central visual field, say for advancing glaucoma, and this would be a setup for this person who had lost a lot of additional vision from elevated pressure with that pupillary membrane, you know, we'd say, look, we just don't see there's any potential, but where, where they would have a, a, a good light field and, and a good rapid projection of light, even in some of these end stages, we, we'd do reconstruction and had some miraculous outcomes. We had, we had some people going from their only eye, you know, uh, what was just projected as just, you know, light perception you know, to getting 2080, 2060 results. And, and uh, I, I think that, that, you know, there's things we can do to try to ascertain. But if, if clearly you, you do a light field on a person like this and the, and the central field is gone, then, then, you know, the telepatient, I just don't see that there's any, you know, reasonable reason why you're going to get any return of vision. And uh, uh, I think it's likely in this case that the odds of getting a, a good outcome are extremely slim, but it, it, it's just, it's, it's uh, you know, there, there are other, other simple things we can do. And, and uh, it's, it's an old art that I think people have forgotten. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Dr. La Rochelle, why don't you kind of go ahead and make your comment and that will uh, be either our last or we can take one more comment if anyone else wants to be unmuted and then we'll do a wrap up. So we'll do actually, it looks like Teresa Long. So we'll do uh, Dr. La Rochelle, Dr. Long, and then I'll do a wrap. Go ahead, Dr. La Rochelle. So I think this case is complicated for several reasons that we sort of already touched on. One of them is expectations from the patient for outcomes. And um, it sounds like, you know, you were maybe telling this patient that we think the outcome isn't going to be good and they still want to pursue surgery, which goes back to autonomy, right? But then when they have the surgery and the outcome isn't good, then they're blaming the surgeon. So I think there's different parts here at play that make it an extra complicated scenario, including the, the issue with compliance. So that can further complicate sort of the, um, the physician's, I think, willingness to go ahead with a surgery that they may think is futile to begin with, um, knowing that if the patient, if it doesn't turn out well, they might blame the surgeon. And if the patient isn't doing their post-op drops or they disappear again, they could have a potentially much worse outcome. Um, and then it feels like it, it falls back on the surgeon again. So, um, you know, this is, this is a, just a tough one in general. And it, it sort of lies between all the things we think about with not wanting to give up on a patient and have that, that patient feel like we are doing every possible thing, even if they're just getting another little glimmer of light after surgery, they may feel like that is worth it. Whereas um, like in that first case, we were talking about doing a cataract surgery or doing a trial of steroids, um, don't have that 
terrible outcome potentials, whereas maybe there's more to gain. Whereas this type of surgery is much more involved if it's an IOL exchange and oil removal in someone that's non-compliant and they could have hypotony afterwards. It's just the risk benefit ratio feels different, especially in a patient that may not be have the insight that, that some right. of the other patients that we were talking about do, so. Right. Actually, Dr. Petty, I have one more slide I need to go through before we wrap it up. So I'm gonna uh, mm-hmm. show one more. So, um, so, the, uh, so the, 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 it, another layer of complexity to this case is that the patient is, uh, does not have insurance and it will be out of pocket for her. So the cost of the surgery is uh, and, uh, estimated to be around 25K. So financial assistance is requested. And the surgeon would have to write a medical necessity letter for her to get this. <laughs> so then my next question is the cost matter. And then I, you know, for me, I, that question came to my mind and I, I caught myself like, should I have even asked that question because that's not fair for the patient uh, to even think about cost in this situation. And uh, there is something uh, in the AMA code of medical ethics that kind of answer my question here is that Although a physician have an obligation to consider the needs of broader patient populations within the context of the patient-physician relationship, um, their first duty must be to the individual patient. And when I, I brought up the cost, because in my mind, I said $25,000, that is what you can provide like 20 cataract surgery to 20 patients versus for one case like this, that may not, get her vision better than hand motion. So that is the another complexity point here that maybe you guys can agree or not agree with this statement here. Uh, you know, thank you for introducing this. Uh, it, it touches on so many, and particularly justice, of course, is, is one of the tenets that this particularly you know, points to, but uh, this, boy, this, this is an entire um, additional one hour discussion. Uh, one thing we've learned about Zoom, the worst thing you can do is ruin a great discussion by going long and having people drop off. Teresa, I'm gonna give you an actual 30 seconds and because I guess I've been named as your boss, I can cut you off at 30 seconds and then we'll have our final wrap up. Okay, so the first thing that I thought about was um, a lot of times when we don't recommend a surgery or we say that there's really not good visual potential for a patient um, and we, uh, we're recommending, we're not recommending doing something, I think a lot of times the patient can feel abandoned. And um, especially in a lot of these cases where there's um, views on one side or the other, I think it's really important to have the patient know that even though we're not recommending something, we're still here with you and we're still here to care for your eyes. That's one. Um, two, I think the a relationship of time in a lot of these cases was really interesting. So a lot of times as a referral center, we're sent patients and it's our first time getting to know them and they already have a very complex um, situation. And so it, even though particularly in the second case, we did um, potentially prolong the suffering of the patient by prolonging the suffering, it gave us more time to assess the consistency and her understanding um, of something to give us more information to make the right decision. It's a very different case oftentimes when you've had a years of long of a relationship with a patient and you know them and you understand their values um, versus just meeting someone for the first time. Um, Dr. Long, those, those are two beautiful comments. Um, I'll ask you to kind of um, put your third in the chat because people will have to get off right at nine. Um, and I do apologize for interrupting there. I'm going to add one more thing to the chat again. Uh, Eileen Huang really deserves all the credit. I've actually just posted in the chat both her email and her cell phone. So if you would all mind, certainly resident, since I'm your boss, I can uh, command you, I guess, to text her right now and just say thank you for this ethics conference. Uh, and anyone else who enjoyed the conversation, I, I think a, uh, it would certainly warrant uh, a, a, an acknowledgement. Thank you to her via email, certainly. Uh, and with that, um, let me go ahead and uh, if people do need to leave, they can. Dr. Long, why don't we let you finish up your last thought? You were so articulate in your first two. Let, let's go ahead and continue on that train as we sign off. Final words, go ahead. And then the last one, uh, the last pearl that I thought of is um, cultural differences. So there's a really wonderful book that I read in an ethics class in college called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And at the 
end of the book, after you listen to the story of this young Hmong child who has seizures and her parents understanding and the care between the medical system and um, cultural differences, there are eight questions that you can use to assess the patient's understanding um, culturally uh, and understand where they're coming from with their treatment. And so it's a really wonderful book if you haven't read it, um, but and the questions are actually quite useful when there's more challenging situations. I find that uh, more questions are also helpful. And then Dr. Long, if you can get us that those questions, we can actually send that out to the group uh, in follow-up. Um, uh, thank you everyone, uh, Hung Embley, Ariana, Dr. Uh, Brad. This is this was really exceptional. Thank you and, and uh, was very enriched. And uh, the challenge would be to think of these four tenants in the next couple of days and how they are uh, interfacing with you and your patients uh, in, in your lives. Thank you everyone, have a beautiful day. Thank you.